Oh, hello, Tony. How are you doing? Andrew, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I, oh, good. It's my first. So you've been on this channel before, but I haven't spoken to you before, have I? I've missed you. No, I mean, I know about your work, but uh, I don't think you and I have spoken before. Oh, well, it's great. I love talking to former Scientologists. For some reason, the people on my channel and my podcast, the listeners seem to really, really enjoy hearing about it. So this is actually a wonderful uh, opportunity. So, I mean, so tell me what we're going to talk about today, because there's some stuff about Valerie Honey and, and who, who is that? Give me a little. In fact, no, let's let's go back for people who didn't hear you last time or the last times. Tell us a little bit about your background. Okay, well, number one, I'm not a former Scientologist. I'm just a journalist like you. Uh, and I, I gave myself the job a decade ago of just covering Scientology like a daily beat. And uh, so that's what I'm known for is I just cover it like a daily beat. I, I keep an eye on the litigation. And uh, so I was the editor in chief of the Village Voice and I was writing about Scientology there. Um, I'm now at my own website. I'm using Substack, tonyortega.substack.com. And I have a new story about Scientology every morning at 7 a.m. Uh, New York time. So, uh, you know, I've gotten to know a lot of people that were in Scientology. And, of course, I, I cover very closely these cases. And there's a very interesting lawsuit involving this woman, Valerie Haney, that you mentioned. Valerie um, was a Sea Org worker. Those are the folks that signed the billion-year contract and agreed to work around the clock for their entire lives. And she was very in tight. She was actually working directly with David Miscavige and Shelley Miscavige in their quarters at Int Base. She was literally serving them their meals and, and knew them intimately. Um, she then eventually became, her job was she was casting for Scientology videos. So she was wrangling the, the actors and stuff. Uh, and she finally decided to get out of there. And the thing about the Sea Org is it's really difficult to get out particularly where she was, she was at this secretive int base where they have these, you know, fences and security guards. The way she got out was she literally, she had cast this video they were making. And just before it all broke up, she crawled into the trunk of one of the actors who then drove back to LA. And that's literally how she got away. So that was in 2016. In 2019, uh, she had gone to work for Leah Remini as her assistant. And she was the surprise featured uh, guest on the first episode of Leah's third and final series, uh, series uh, Scientology in the Aftermath. So Valerie got great exposure, but she sued in 2019 saying that not only had she been held against her will while she was working at Scientology, but then she'd been under this terrible harassment when she left and went to work for Leah. And so that's what her lawsuit is about. Scientology though, uh, successfully con convinced a judge that while she was in the Sea Org and, and when she left, that Valerie had signed various contracts that contained an arbitration clause that said, you know, I will never sue Scientology. Any problem I have with Scientology, I will handle internally. And Scientology ha supposedly has this internal justice procedure called religious arbitration. So the judge said, yeah, contract's a contract and forced Valerie into that. So uh, she tried to resist it for a couple of years, couldn't get anywhere. And then a new judge came along and said, look, you've got to at least try this thing. So on July 1st, she submitted a letter. And the way it's supposed to work is she's supposed to ask Scientology for arbitration. And it's, it's a pen to show you how inherently unfair it is. The way the arbitration is supposed to work is they're supposed to have three arbitrators on the panel who are all Scientologists in good standing, like Scientologists in good standing are ever going to hear fairly a case like Valerie's, yeah. right? So exactly. she, so her job is to nominate one of them. She has to nominate somebody who's in good standing. Then Scientology will nominate a second. And then those two arbitrators will choose a third. That's how it's supposed to go. But Valerie's against the whole thing. And as a matter of protest, who she nominated for her arbitrator was Elizabeth Moss, the actress. And we yes. know we know that Elizabeth Moss is a Scientologist in good standing. She just gave an interview to the New Yorker magazine a couple of months ago, right? I mean, but and we this, should just say this, that's the the woman from The Handmaid's Tale uh, for anyone who isn't isn't familiar. And David Miscavige, when you talk, you know, that is the 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 head of Scientology. Just for anyone who's not entirely familiar with the Scientology stuff, 
Right. And, and a lot of people over the several years have raised that question. How is a Scientologist starring in a TV series about a religious dystopia? You know, I mean, it does yeah. seem it does seem crazy. Right. But it, she's definitely a Scientologist. She's grew up in it. Her parents were Scientologists. And so Valerie nominated her and uh, we waited and waited. And then the Scientology sent her a letter recently and it told her that they had uh, it, it implied that they had actually they didn't use her name, but they said the person you chose for arbitrator has declined. So they, they implied that they actually approached Elizabeth Moss and asked her if she would do this. And, and Elizabeth Moss supposedly yeah, said it. no. So now they've asked Valerie submit a new name and you have two weeks. So this week she submitted a new letter saying, OK, the first thing she did, I thought was really smart. She pointed out that, look, Scientology's got all these rules and regulations, and that's what they're sticking by to make her go through this whole ridiculous process. But she pointed out there's nothing in the rules that says somebody can decline a nomination. So what's the justification for Elizabeth Moss saying no? I thought that was a very smart point on Valerie's wow. you know, side. So anyway, she named her new arbitrator. She named Tom Cruise. Why not? And she said, if Tom's busy, <laughs> then she's naming Shelley Miscavige. So it's really important to know who these two people are. I mean, Tom Cruise is one of the most famous actors in the world. He's also been a Scientologist since 1986. And he's Scientology's most famous celebrity. And he's best friends with David Miscavige, the leader of the church. And I know you've probably seen this, Andrew. The tabloids are constantly suggesting that Tom's on his way out. I just saw a new one in the National Enquirer. I mean... The tabloids love to say that Tom's leaving, but there's never any evidence of it. I mean, all the evidence I've seen is that Tom is as dedicated to Scientology today as ever. So, I mean, there's no question he's a Scientologist in good standing. And Valerie is right, you know, is, has the right to nominate him. But we'll see if they come back. Now, her backup choice, Shelley Miscavige, is very interesting. That is the wife of David Miscavige, the leader of Scientology. And she has not been seen at Scientology events or in public for years and years. Um, my reporting suggests that in the late summer 2005, she was taken, not, she was living at Int Base, where there's this thing called the hole. And people always ask me, did they put her in the hole? No, that's the base she disappeared from. And my belief is that they took her about 60 miles up to this small mountain compound near Lake Arrowhead, California, a small compound called the Church of Spiritual Technology, CST. And that's where they do their archiving project, where they're putting L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of Scientology, putting his words on stainless steel plates and storing them in titanium boxes to last thousands of years in an underground vault. And she went up there to work on that. And she was seen once after that, she was seen at the funeral of her father uh, two years later, 2007, with a Scientology handler. And she's not been seen since. Now, I've, I have a couple sightings, one that I reported some, a while back. Somebody thinks they may have seen her in a nearby town in 2015, but nothing official. I mean, you know, they've been kept keeping her out of sight now for 17 years. Wow. So Valerie naming her as an arbitrator is really interesting to see how Scientology is going to react. Wow, that's fascinating. So she's hoping to sort of, well, I don't know. I, I guess she's trying to expose the whole thing and really get to the bottom of where Shelley is. But unfortunately, it does sound as though, from the way you describe it, that they can just, you know, obfuscate everything. And, you know, because they didn't even ask Elizabeth Moss, did they? I mean, and even if they did, maybe they, they put, it's not like she can say, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. And they'll let her do it, you know? Yeah, you know, the, the, the really frustrating thing for Valerie, and I know there's some, the, the only previous case where a court-ordered arbitration like this has actually happened, happened a few years ago to a California couple named Luis and Rocio Garcia. And they went through this, this whole thing, and they said it was a farce. Uh, they also had trouble naming arbitrators. That dragged on for more than a year until the judge stepped in and selected them himself. And then once they had the arbitrating panel, they went through this arbitration and Luis described it as a joke. He said they weren't allowed to have an attorney. They couldn't have a transcript. They couldn't even bring their smartphone with them. And 90% uh, of the evidence they brought with them was not allowed. 
Right. And uh, they were asking for hundreds of thousands of dollars. They believed they were defrauded out of. And the panel awarded them like 18,000. I'm sure it was just a token thing. And they refused it. They, they went back to the judge, appealed, said this was all a joke. The judge said, no, he's accepting it. They then appealed it higher. And the 11th Circuit of the United States affirmed the ruling. So at least in part of the country, Scientology's arbitration has been signed off on by the U.S. court system. It's, it's kind of shocking. Is the implication then that Scientology has its claws in, you know, somewhere deeper in, in the American legal system? Well, they, you know, as, as Lawrence Wright pointed out in the HBO movie Going Clear, and, and mm -hmm. full disclosure, I was lucky enough to be in that too. Lawrence Wright put it best. He said, once they got tax exempt status in 1993, they were protected. And that is the first thing they do in court is remind the judge that they are a tax exempt religious organization. And so the judges have limited ability to look at their rules. And that's how this, why this arbitration thing is so powerful for them is that once a judge decides, yes, you signed a contract, you have to go into arbitration then the judge can then at that point do nothing because if the judge then attempted to say, well, maybe you should let them have an attorney. No, 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 that's, that's interfering with their religious rights. They then have as a religion, the ability to set all the rules. I always hear from people that say, Tony, why can't the judge, you know, make sure she has an attorney or get a transcript. And I said that once the judge makes that decision, judge's hands are off and it's all up to Scientology what happened. So, I love that Valerie is doing this and mocking the whole uh, process by naming these arbitrators. But the sad thing is Scientology gets to set all the rules here. Yeah. yeah, it's the most remarkable thing. And I suppose it actually annoys me that any religion can do that. They're sort of above the law. It shouldn't. That's not right, is it? It's uh, I mean, this is one of the things that's motivated me the most all these years is, is Scientology is a bully and and they have taken American certain American ideals about, uh, you know, our system of laws and turn them on their heads and they're using the First Amendment as a weapon. And I just I find it remarkable that most of these judges allow it to go on. Now, there are some judges who are a little more light, enlightened about this and seem to understand things. Another case that uh, was forced into arbitration in California is interesting because it was Danny Masterson's accusers. And their, their, their lawsuit is not about the allegations of rape that he's facing in criminal court, but in their civil lawsuit, they're, they're, they're suing because they say once they came forward to the LAPD, they were then the subject of a, of a Scientology harassment campaign. And just, again, to help the new people, Danny Masterson, former actor on That 70s Show, is a lifelong Scientologist and a, and a very active Scientology celebrity. He's accused of raping multiple women in the early 2000s who were Scientologists at the time. In their, in their civil lawsuit, they're saying that once they came forward, they were subjected to harassment, and that's what they're suing over. A judge said, yeah, just like in Valerie's case, a contract's a contract, even though it's like they're, accused, they're, they're accusing Scientology of killing their pets. And the court is saying, yeah, but you signed a contract saying that you can't sue. So he denied them trial, but that was overturned by an appeals court. And that appeals court in California, these judges were a little more enlightened. They said, okay, look, we understand you signed a contract. Scientology expects it to run forever. But these, this harassment, the killing of pets and things happened after they had left the church. So if oh. they, if, yeah, if they've left and Scientology then harms you, how can you be subjected to their ecclesiastical justice systems anymore? So yeah. that that was a big reversal and restored that lawsuit. So Scientology has now petitioned that to the U.S. Supreme Court, Andrew. So, so we're That's waiting insane. to see. Now, now, the U.S. Supreme Court rarely picks up, you know, they, you know, people submit hundreds of petitions every year and the U.S. Supreme Court only chooses a few to look at. So the odds are very long. But Scientology, I mean, I, I think you'll find this interesting. Um, four amicus briefs, friends of the court letters, have been filed by other religious organizations on Scientology's behalf. 
they perceive this as an attack on religious freedom in general. Right. So again, Scientology is accused of surveilling, stalking, hacking, and killing the pets of former members. And they want to sue the church. And these religious organizations are coming to Scientology's rescue saying, yes, Supreme Court, religious freedom is in jeopardy. It's, it's so bizarre. It's, it reminds me a little bit of um, you get these political votes, don't you? Like uh, with Scotland wanting to leave the UK, Spain voted against it because they don't want uh, Catalonia to to leave. You know, it's that kind of political stuff. But but also exactly. maybe would you rule out? I mean, Scientology apparently has so much money and stuff. Maybe they might even be paying these religious uh, groups to speak up on their behalf. There is no doubt. There is a long history of Scientology paying people I call religious shills and I have, I have receipts. I mean, they, they are people who present themselves as um, interfaith figures uh, who might be Christian or Jewish or, or, and, and, and go on to these uh, and present themselves as outsiders uh, sticking up for the church Scientology. And I have uncovered records showing that they are on the payroll. There was one guy who was getting $8,000 a month from the church of Scientology to present himself as a Christian interfaith expert, expert defending Scientology. Now, I don't know if, the, if there's anything like that in this particular set of amicus briefs, because there also is a tradition of religions kind of sticking together, even when it's somebody like Scientology accused of killing pets, Andrew. I mean, Unbelievable. It's uh, yeah. beggar's belief. It's disgusting. And I, I can't believe that contracts... I, I don't know much about law. I can't believe there are such a, there's such a thing as a contract that you sign to say you won't sue them, no matter what. I mean, that's ridiculous. That shouldn't exist because the very the very fact that that contract exists and 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 actually works in a court of law means somebody probably is going to break the law. That's the whole point, and they're going to you know not treat you right. Uh, that shouldn't be able to exist. And they've been signed. They've signed it under under pressure. You know. No, but I mean, come on, who would sign such a thing going into a religion? But the, the situation is that you're taking some courses, you think this thing is cool, and you, 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 you think you're getting some enlightenment, some spiritual advancement. That's the context. Oh, by the way, sign this, please. And people don't know what they're signing, you know. Yeah, it's a question. Um, yeah. And then I w also wanted to, uh, I brought up Danny Madison, so I should tell you a little bit about the criminal side. Um, mm. So Danny is accused um, uh, that there are three women who were Scientologists at the time who allege that he raped them between 2001 and 2003. They say they didn't come forward sooner because they feared retaliation from the church. They say that the church, you know, Church of Scientology uh, definitely told them not to report things like that to the police. In June 2020, the district attorney's office charged Danny on these three alleged rapes, but also revealed that they had considered the allegations of five women before charging on three. And under California strict one strike law, there's no statute of limitations because these, by charging them as multiple felonies at once, he's facing a potential life sentence. And when there's a potential life sentence, there's no statute of limitations. So that's how that works. If he's convicted of all three, he's looking at 45 years to life in prison. <gasps> oh, my God. So for the last two years, he has been he's hired some of the biggest, most famous defense attorneys, Tom Mesereau, for example, who defended Michael Jackson and uh, mm -hmm. Robert Blake. And um, what a CV. And, and he has he has uh, they have filed every conceivable motion and petition and appeal to slow this thing down. But they're running out of options. They got a judge, Judge Charlene Omedo at Los Angeles Superior Court, who is, you know, she's very fair. She's she's strict with both sides, but she's not, you know, putting up with delays. She's really pushing this thing down the road. And at this point, she has a October 11th start date for this trial. Now, the last thing Danny tried to delay it was actually pretty crazy. His, his attorneys now are Philip Cohen and Sean Hawley, who was a member of the original O.J. Simpson dream team. 
And I knew that Sean Hall, I, I, I could see there was some, the docket is kind of like the, for us in the public, you can't really see everything going on in a criminal docket, but I could see something was going on and that Sean Hawley was trying to delay things and I didn't know why. Then I got really lucky, got a hold of some documents that were in the pub, in the docket, some documents, and it showed that the, the way she was trying to delay this case was she was saying that she was handling the very secret arbitration of a Los Angeles Dodgers pitcher named Trevor Bauer. And I know this may not be a big story in England, but over here, it's kind of a big story that this right. pitcher for the Dodgers got the longest suspension ever from Major League Baseball in April of two years. He couldn't play for two years because three women have accused him of, of mistreating of mistreating them. And he's not been charged criminally, but Major League Baseball can suspend a player even if they haven't been uh, charged. So secretly, that arbitra he appealed it, and so secretly the arbitration began in May, and Sean Hawley uh, admitted to the judge, I'm handling that. I can't handle both at the same time. And so she was asking Danny's criminal rape trial, which could put him in prison for life, to be delayed so she could handle the suspension of a baseball player. So I broke that news. <laughs> and the, that same day, one of the victims was so outraged that she and her attorneys put out a statement saying, come on, you can't push back this rape trial for some baseball pitcher. And sure enough, the judge held firm. She's reaffirmed it. This is going to start October 11th. Danny's running out of ways to stop this thing. And, I, and you know, I think Scientology is very concerned. They had a preliminary hearing last May, and I went to that in Los Angeles. And I even I was surprised how much Scientology was part of the case because these women are testifying that this is why they didn't come forward sooner, is that they were afraid of retaliation. And even Scientology, like policy, became part of the trial. And that's a very limited, a preliminary hearing is a very limited kind of, proceeding when they have the trial andrew it's going to be like six weeks long they're going to bring in multiple witnesses multiple documents it's going to be a nightmare for the church of scientology because so far the church of scientology is being portrayed as an organization that punishes victims and tells its people not to turn in rapists and that's going to continue so if Danny's going to try to stop this trial, he's only got about five more weeks to go. And I don't know, you know, I, I suppose what he could possibly do at this point is approach the DA and plead, you know, look for a plea deal. But he's the kind of guy I feel might roll the dice. I'm not I'm not sure. I mean, I'm planning to go. I figure it's going to happen. Man, it's it's such a weird one, though, because Scientology, they must know that everybody already thinks those kinds. Unless I'm mistaken, I feel like, is the public perception not already that they're a dangerous cult? Uh, so what are they worried about? <laughs> you know, I was I was shocked that they even allowed the preliminary hearing to go on. I thought they would have made Danny cop a plea by that. I mean, so much bad stuff came out. And and it's been a, the pandemic's been very difficult on Scientology. I think they're hurting badly. The last thing they need is a publicity from this trial. And yeah, I mean, they they do their best to put out all this PR about what a great or organization they are. But I think the public, especially after Leah Remini's series, they understand this thing operates like a mafia. It's yeah. vindictive, it's retaliatory, it's scary, and it rules through fear. And that's going to come out in this trial. Do you think he'll... Um, so when, when you say 45 years, Danny Masterson... And, and just again, for anyone who's just joining now, it's, as you say, it was this guy from the 70s show, the one with the curly hair, uh, accused of, uh, you know, I don't, I, again, what words I can use on YouTube, but, you know, accused by like, several women. Um, could, could he actually, would he serve 45, it's the rest of his life, really? Or is it one of those ones where they say that, and then he's like out in t a day? Do you know what I mean? I think it would be if if he really got 45 years, he'd have to serve like 20 of them or 25 okay. of them, something like that before he, I, I don't know exactly what the, the rule is in California, what, how soon you get. Um, but I mean, I, I would think that he would, you know, I would think David Miscavige is, is coming to him and saying, look, the church can't go through this plead, plead and, and, and plead to 10, take 10 years. You'll be out in seven. You'll still be in your fifties, you know, uh, so I don't know. I'm kind of surprised that it's gone this far, but he might be the kind of guy that thinks he can roll the dice, charm a jury just sitting there, 
And, uh, and you never know with a jury. I mean, you never know. The, the way these cases work here, and they probably work the same way in the UK, the defense just does everything it can to attack the women, attack their credibility, attack their integrity. That's horrible. And, and, you know, they did very well through that last May. The judge was very impressed by them. So, but you never know with a jury. Man, I mean, with all respect to due process, I mean, what a, what a piece of work. I mean, this guy, so he was born into Scientology. Is that right? So his parents were Scientologists. I guess you don't get a real sense of the outside world and you must just think you can do anything. If they, especially, they must have put him forward to be in that 70s show or, or something. Well, he had been a child actor. I mean, his parents, his mother was very ah. ambitious and he had been in commercials by the time he was four or five years old. Uh, I interviewed his his former stepfather about his childhood and everything. And oh, wow. yeah, very, very ambitious parents. All four of the siblings, uh, Danny Masterson, his younger brother, Christopher Masterson, and their younger half siblings, Alana Masterson and Jordan Masterson are all actors who have had substantial roles in TV shows. Um, and so, but they, you know, they've, they've been Scientology royalty their whole lives and Scientology caters to them. Um, and yeah, in Scientology, I mean, just to give you an example, the, the woman, the woman who goes by the name Jane Doe one, she alleges that she was attacked on in April, 2003, and she went to the church immediately and they responded by having her do $15,000 worth of counseling in order to find what evil things she had done in past lives that would make her a victim in this lifetime. Because that's what Scientology is, right? Scientology is past life counseling, where you're supposed to go back millions and billions of years on other planets and find out what you've done through all these different lifetimes. And that, that helps you uh, be more, you know, a, kind of a superhuman in this life. But that's how they responded when she, this is going to come out in the trial. This, the, when they, when she went to them and said, Danny Masson is, you know, rape me, their, their reaction was, okay, you need to do some counseling to find out what you did wrong. Oh, man. That's like we had in England, we had the coach of the national soccer or football team who, uh, oh, I guess it was 20 years ago now, but he said to a journalist when he thought he was off air that he thought that disabled people had done bad things in a past life and he was promptly fired then for, for those. And it was a, hu a huge scandal. So I guess that's quite, I don't think he was a Scientologist as far as I know, but I guess he the same sort of belief system it is it's 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 a, it's a central idea in scientology the the phrase they use is you pulled it in if you're a victim of crime or you know you have a bankruptcy or whatever you pulled it in what did you do that made yourself a victim uh and that's that's part of why these women waited so long to come forward is that scientology drills that into their heads oh my god Tell me about the um, Sea Org workers and that another law, lawsuit involving labor transporting, we're calling it. Right. Uh, so there's another major lawsuit filed uh, in April by three Australians who uh, the residents of Australia, I think one's from Germany. And um, they sued in Tampa, Florida, because they said that they were forced into the Sea Org when they were children. And I've talked to many former Scientologists that signed their billion year contract when they were 10, 11 years old. I've talked to a couple of people who were six years old when they signed their billion year contract. And uh, not only were they forced into the Sea Org, but then they, be, they were sent on to the Free Winds, which is Scientology's floating church uh, cruise ship that just sails around in the Caribbean. And they claimed that they were treated horribly, both as children and as adults on the ship, and that uh, they were unable to leave, and just a whole litany of terrible treatment and punishments uh they just they they felt like they were slaves and so they have finally got out and now they're suing for labor trafficking in this tampa's uh courtroom uh one of them one of the three valesca paris is also alleging that she was sexually assaulted by other workers and and that she was punished when she came forward with it so scientology naturally has responded by filing motions saying you've signed contracts you can't sue us in court you need to go through arbitration and they just filed those um this past week and so we'll see how these plaintiffs respond to that and this is going to be a tough one i think because 
Uh, I mentioned earlier the case of the Garcias who had been forced into arbitration by a judge. And not only did the court accept it, but the appeals court affirmed it. It's the same courtroom. These, these new people in this new lawsuit are suing literally in the same Tampa courtroom. So there's already precedent for Scientology to get away with this arbitration thing. So, you know, it's, uh, it, it's really, I, I really um, am impressed by these people that they would come forward, put their names on the line, you know, risk being harassed and, and, and step up to sue Scientology. But right now, Scientology has got some very crafty tricks in, in, in litigation. What would it take, do you think, and I guess it's speculation, what would it take for Tom Cruise to be on that list with, I don't know, Polanski and Woody Allen and just the, you know, people that no one wants to work with anymore because of the, the connections in his life? You know, Leah Remini has raised that question. That's a great question, Andrew. It's like, what is it going to take before Tom Cruise is finally, you know, looked at the way he should be looked at? And um, because he's not only a, a avid Scientologist, he's he has seen and at least been complicit in some of its worst practices. I mean, he knew Shelley Miscavige personally. And I, I wish a, I don't get access to him. I wish a reporter would just ask him, you know, your best friend, David Miscavige. Where has his wife been for the last 17 years, you know? Um, but also, he won't Leah Rem- he won't I, respond. I, you can't ask that question because then you'll never get asked back. You know, you can yeah. never have him on your show again. So um, Leah, um, she revealed some really interesting things about Tom. She came out with a book in 2015 called Troublemaker, terrific book about her background in Scientology. And she told me that she had written a contra- uh, uh, chapter about Tom, but she left it out because she didn't want the book to be about Tom. She knew how the press would react, right? So she gave that chapter to me, and I published it on my website, TonyOrtega.org, and you can read that. Um, it's Leah Remini's missing chapter from her book where she talks all about Tom Cruise, the things she saw, and the way she saw Tom Cruise mistreating people. The other thing I encourage people to look up is a podcast I did at my Substack, TonyOrtega.substack.com, where I talked to Claire Headley, who worked personally with Tom Cruise, and she has some very strong things to say about him in Scientology and the person she saw, and that she is really um, personally offended when she sees all the lavish praise being that Tom's getting simply because there's a movie that sells a lot of tickets, you know, and... But I, I don't know when the when the press, I mean, because, you know, Andrew, the number one question is, why isn't he spending time with his daughter? You know, I mean, Suri is this beautiful, talented 16 year old child now, and he's basically cut her out of his life for the last 10 years. And I'm convinced it's over Scientology um, yeah. and, and Scientology celebrities don't have to follow those rules. If Tom Cruise wanted to. It doesn't matter that Katie left. It doesn't matter that Surrey's not a Scientologist. Tom Cruise could, if he wanted to, see his daughter right now. Why doesn't he? I think he believes it's best for Scientology if he stays away from her. And that's just tragic. And again, no reporter ever asks him about it. It's disgusting, really. And it's just, I guess he must be a psychopath. I don't, I don't know, but he must be. And these people... There's also that thing, even if you're not a psychopath, when somebody helps you from such a young age, you could even argue that Tom Cruise has been groomed to, to an extent. You know, someone comes along and says, we'll make your dream, we'll do this for you. And then you feel some loyalty to them, even if they've done terrible. You know, we'd all, we'd all defend our friends, most of us would, if they've done some terrible things, right? So maybe there's an element of that. Well, there's definitely a lot of indoctrination in Scientology. And people always ask me, well, do, does he stay in simply because they've got some information on him and he doesn't dare leave. And I said, no, he's a believer. He really believes that L. Ron Hubbard is the greatest human being who ever lived and that David Miscavige is the greatest human being on the planet today. He really believes, well, you know, when people say, how could, how could he believe that? I always say, he can't believe that you haven't joined Scientology. I mean, it's just, it's just yeah. that firm belief, you know, uh, and it's, it's something that's going to be very difficult to break through, I think. Yeah. Where can we send people to your where I mean we've mentioned them a little bit, Substack and these kinds of things. Please come to tonyortega.substack.com, sign up for the free emails. You'll get a story from me every morning at 7 a.m. Eastern. 
I also have a podcast there and we talk to some fun people that really know Scientology. They were in it for 30 years, know much better than I, I do. Great revelations every week. Oh, Tony, I'm fascinated by everything you've uncovered for us today. I'm also, I'm, I've just followed you on Twitter because I want to talk to you afterwards. So uh, you know, hopefully you'll see that. And uh, yeah, thank you for coming on. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to believe we haven't crossed paths before because you do some great work in, in basically the same field. So thank you very much for talking with me. Oh, well, that's why, that's why I want us to touch base after. We're going to do some stuff and all of that. So yeah, thank you, Tony. Bet.